today we are going to have another very important lecture series in our marine fisheries management that's we are continuing still with the the fish biology and then how it is important for the fish management uh, today we will be talking about the the the, the fish age and growth what it is and how it is important for fisheries management so uh, growth so this growth can be either population growth or individual growth um, the zoology and aquatic students they already know about these things uh, uh, especially in ecology classes we have already discussed about the population growth how population can, can grow over time but uh, uh, if you remember the logistic and exponential growth but uh, that is the whole population there we talk about the number and the weight how they can grow by number and the weight but here we are going to talk about the individual growth how individuals grow and then what does it mean and then how it is important so that will be the today's discussion right. so individual growth as we know this we will be look, looking at how individuals grow uh, by number and weight so there are so many factors affecting the the growth of fish so that um, for any organism not only for fish but uh, we are particularly concerned here about fish. The environment affects a lot, the availability of food, other physical parameters like the temperature, oxygen, the, the other behavior, the, uh, like even the sexual differences, male and female differences, and the, the density of animals living likewise. There are so many factors that would affect their growth. And uh, so what are we looking at in this here as growth? The growth is the, the increase in the body weight or maybe the length with time. Right? It's very simple terms. That's the increase in size. The size can be either length or weight and how it is changing with time. So that's what we are, will be looking at as growth. And there, of course, of course, the with the age, with the size, their age will be increased as well. So we'll be looking at increase in length as well as increase in weight. That weight can be either wet weight or dry weight. So just in simple terms, right? you just need to know that they, in the growth, we are looking at both length, the increase in growth in length or weight. So <clears throat> actually these uh, things we usually discuss in our practical sessions. So I think after dear students you might have already gone through some of these things in your practicals. But uh, uh, today I will just very briefly go through, go through what is we are measuring if it is the length. Uh, if you are measuring a length of fish, it can be either the standard length, like as highlighted here in the yellow color, that's the standard length, that's the, the, <clears throat> the scientifically accurate length up, up to the end of the, the bony part of a fish. And until the here, we call the fork length, that's, the, the, that's where the, uh, the fin divided into two. And up to that level, we call the fork length and the total length. That that's the maximum depth length that can be that the fish can have. <clears throat> but if it is like a shell, or if it is a, like the invertebrate type of prone, so we have to look at a different aspect. Like if it is a shell length in a in a uh, muscles and a, the carapace and a, the the body length in a prone, uh, right? It may be different in different animals. So. Very simply, we can use many 
uh, equipment to measure the length from very basic instrument. To, as you can see in the bottom, there are electronic devices even with a laser guided, electronic devices with the software and, and even automatically measure the length of it. So imagine the scientists have developed even automated system to measure the length. And because it is so important uh, for its fisheries management. So we'll discuss later on why it is important. That's why they have developed all these devices to measure their length. So <clears throat> when you're measuring the, 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 the growth, we have to measure, as I mentioned before, either length or the weight. But there are a lot of things to be considered in measuring the length or weight, but uh, it's not the whole idea here to learn how to measure this thing. But what you need to know is it's so important that uh, we measure the, the length as well as the weight, and uh, eventually we need to uh, calculate the growth. So why it is important? measuring the growth. As you would see from this, these images, you can see the, the fish can be in different shape, just like a human, like some uh, fatty, some uh, uh, right, lengthy or their height is too high. And the, some fish have very proportional body sizes, whereas some have uh, disproportionate body sizes. So, some can be fatty and or some can be skinny. So these are actually a, a matter of their growth, depend on actually the, how they grow. So to see how they grow or whether they grow really well, you can measure it by measuring their length and weight. You measure their length and weight. If you put this together, uh, and if you can plot a graph, a length versus weight, where you can get some idea about whether there is the weight versus length, if there is any very good relationship, like in here, uh, the graph between the weight and length, you've got a very good uh, a graph with a, a nice slope. That means there is some proportionate growth, but uh, Again, we are not quite sure yet whether it's a proportionate growth or not. But in this case, from this kind of a graph, you can convert. Like you have the graph now, you have the, the, the equation, y equals mx plus b. And as far as you have this equation, then you can convert length versus weight. Like if you have the weight, you can convert that into length, or if you have the length data, you can convert it into weight. So, for some purposes, you might need this one, right? So, the, you can do that conversion from length to weight or vice versa. Now, <clears throat> again, if you plot a graph for the same species, maybe from different places, so they might have a different curves like here. For the same species, you plot a graph between the weight and length, and it came out with a different graph. So this graph is so a little bit of a bit of proportionate, whereas the other graph for the same weight, their length is very high. But in this case, for the same weight, the length is sort of a proportionate. Right? But this one is in proportion, uh, this, this proportion, it will be the proportion is not very really good. So that again, a good indication that this, the same fish living in a different environment, they have different growth. Right? So this is very important. Um, like uh, actually, if we had the chance to have a practical class, so you usually do this kind of a, a comparison, the length weight relationship, which where we put a graph to see whether they are the, the condition is good or not, the environmental conditions uh, by putting this kind of graph uh, for the condition factor. Right? So from 
just plotting this graph, you can get some idea whether that uh, the environment where the fish live is appropriate or the good for that for their survival. Right? So in that way, the length weight relationship you can uh, one way calculate the length and weight, or you can convert one from one another. That's another thing you can see if the environment is good or not good for the or not fit for them. How we are going to do it? You plot this graph, uh, weight versus length. Right? Usually, you know, there is a relationship with the, the weight and the length. It's proportionate, but the, the weight is proportionate to uh, uh, some factor of the length. It's not exactly the proportionate, but a certain factor. Here I mentioned as a P, so that's the factor. Uh, and to remove that uh, the proportionate mark, we have to multiply this equation by a constant. The constant is the A here. So now here the P, the value for the P, and it depends on the amount. So if, if the uh, so scientific studies have shown if the B is somewhere close to the number three, right? That in this relationship, if B is equal to three, which means that fish has a very proportionate growth. The proportionate growth means the environment is good for them. The, the habitat where they are living is good. So the condition, that's why we call it as a condition factor. Uh, so, if that B is different from 3, or is it lower than 3, or higher than 3, which means that the, the growth is not good, which means the environment is not good, right? So, as you can see, the, the with time, over the time, the fish get larger by size or length, length or the weight. But it's still the, the the shape remains the same, right? But um, like in this case, if it is the B value, right, it should be simple B actually. The B if it is greater than three, which means they are put lot of weight for their size, which means they are more fatty. At the same time, if the B is less than three, which means they are elongated over their skin, right? So, as you would see from here, just looking at the, 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 the relationship between the length and weight, you just can get an, an idea about this. If the, 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 the environment where the fish live is good to, uh, suitable for the, the fish to live, right? Now, <clears throat> keeping that one in mind, uh, let's go a little bit further into the, 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 the fish growth and how it is important. Uh, usually fish have actually, a, usually animals have different form of growth. One form of growth we call the determinate growth. Like us, the people or the human being, we have very fast growth at the beginning. And after the after we become mature, and there won't be any significant increase in their height or the length. Uh, but whereas some animals, like in the fish, actually if they have chance or if there is no any limiting factor, they will grow throughout their life. Right? It doesn't mean that they are going to increase their size ever, but uh, like they will have very high growth at the beginning, and that will reduce, of course, after the maturity, but uh, the rate of increase will be low, but still they can grow, right? If you keep a fish in a tank for quite long period of time, they might put on a bit of a weight or the size, right? That is because they have some sort of indeterminate size, not like us. No matter how long you live, usually the height, 
want to increase, but uh, maybe the, the rate might differ, but the type will change, right? So, so this is the normal behavior the, in the fish growth, like a very high growth at the beginning and reduce the growth with the maturity. And thereafter, that, uh, that will greatly reduce the, the rate, but still they can go, right? So that's a typical a curve that you will see. We call this as the growth curve, right? The, the, the length uh, with time, right? How the, the length increases with age or the time. So now, why do we worry about the growth of fish? That is something we have to think of. Why do we worry? If you are a fisheries man, what does it matter? Just knowing the age of fish or the, their growth, why it is. But uh, uh, as we discussed before, the growth is some sort of a assessment of how good the environment is for them, as we've discussed before. And, and the other or the another way that we can think of how they grow with their time, like whether they have the, the, the same proportion of growth with time. Right? But more than that, in the fisheries management, actually fish age as well as their growth with time is going to give a lot more than that especially in the fisheries management, as I have mentioned here, there are many things that we can get uh, from just knowing their growth as well as their age. Right? So you don't know yet what these are, but like population dynamics, how they change their population over time and uh, like how they change with the fishing, like uh, the impact of fishing and the, how the management influence on the fish and if there is a lot of fishing in a particular area, that will reflect in their growth as well. Right? Like if you have a very good management program, the, the growth of fish may be very different. And from a place where there is no management, there the, fish, the growth of fish will be different. So likewise for a fisheries managed, actually there's a lot more than that way that you can get a lot of things out of this, uh, just knowing the uh, age as well as the growth of fish. That's, that's why actually we are learning here. Uh, so as soon as I mean that you are going to be a fisheries manager in the future, of course, most of you won't be, but at least if some of you will be a, a fisheries manager in the future, or someone will be involved in the subject, so this is, very important something that you have to look at. Right? Okay, with that, let's move into how are we going to determine the fish growth? Right? Again, if you want to know the growth, you need to measure either length or the weight and the age. Right? So it's very clear and you need to know the, the size, either from the length or the weight, as well as the age. So that's the growth you know, with the age, how much they put on their weight or the length. So how are we how are we going to know the growth? The, the first approach is we can look at how individual fish grow. That is from direct observation. Like if you can grow them in a, a pond, you take a smaller a fish and put them in a, in a pond and see you record them weekly, monthly, or annually and see how they grow. It's very accurate, 100% accurate. You know exactly how they grow and you put a graph or whatever that you may get an average, um, you measure the 100 or 1000 and you get average how they grow. Right, <clears throat> but always you can't do that one, especially for the marine fish. You can't grow them in a pond and it is not practically something you can do. Place them in a pond or a hatchery or anywhere. The second thing is we call the mark and recapture method. Uh, again, zoology and aquatic students and even the biology students usually know what it is, the mark and recapture method. And we have come to that one later on. You can use that one to uh, 
division the role. The second approach, I with you, the, the approach B, uh, is the, the average growth. And how we can measure the average growth of a, a fish group or the population uh, that we can do using some sort, of, some sort of a graphically or statistically, we can determine the, the average growth or what we call the length frequency distribution, which I will come to in a moment. Right. So that is a, a um, we are looking at the average growth of the population. So the second approach, of course, the, the in the average fish growth is the use, using the fish hard parts. You can uh, measure the age uh, of the individual uh, using hard parts. But if you then know the length at that age, then you can determine the growth. Right? I hope you got the idea. Right? So, using the hard parts, like in the the rings in a tree, you can usually calculate the age of a tree. Similarly, you can use the the bony parts, number how many rings in their bones. If you know the age and the size of the fish for that age, then you can determine their uh, growth, right? So these are the approaches that we'll be looking at, right? Um, so if I explain a little bit on uh, each and every aspect of this uh, different uh, methods of uh, determining their growth, in this case, this is the length frequency analysis of length frequency distribution. Uh, don't get uh, confused these terms, right? It's not something very complicated. So you just measure the, the length of fish, like you take thousands of fish, same fish, and you measure their length, uh, maybe as uh, length classes, like how many of five to 10 size centimeters or the 10 to 15, 15 to 20, like right? you put them into size classes and, uh, and you plot a graph with the frequency, right? What is the frequency of uh, this size and what is the frequency of that size? Likewise, you put this graph and using this graph, you can determine the, the, the age of the fish. If you know the age and you know the sizes anyway, and you can determine the, uh, the growth, right? Again, uh, by just looking at you can't do it, but there is a way I'll explain later on, right? The other one is the, the mark and recapture method, as I mentioned. Uh, what you do is you just mark some of the fish and you catch them after some time, maybe after months, usually not after months, maybe one year, four years, five years, like this. annually you catch and see the, what is their growth, and from that you can determine. And the other method is the using hard part, as I mentioned before, like uh, uh, the measuring the, uh, the the size of the, the hard parts and as well as their number of rings in their hard parts. I'll come to that one later on, right? So then you realize from that you can determine, right? So uh, mark and recapture method, uh, I'm not going to explain uh, what it is, but uh, it's very basically what you do is you go to somewhere, uh, maybe coastal zone or where the fish are, you catch certain number of fish, uh, we call, uh, you say you catch 100 of them and we mark them. All the fish that caught, they will be marked. The number of fish marked, we we'll say M. And uh, uh, then uh, uh, after some time, right, uh, we we'll catch some fish, right? Uh, Maybe after one year, two years, 
Now, how many we captured? Right? How many of them captured? Because we don't know whether they have the mark or not, but we catch it, whatever we can. That's the C. And among the, the captured uh, individual, we see how many of them have the, the marks. If you know, we, of course, you know all these. You don't know M, C, and R. And using this equation, you can uh, estimate the population size. Right? So it's something like this. You don't know the population size of the the size of the population. You don't know. That's you have to estimate. You select certain number of them, mark them, right? And uh, later time you catch them. This is number. Of, you caught four, and if they, among them there's two of them were at the mark, and then. From using that equation, you can estimate the population size. So the immediate population size. So that's how we use this uh, uh, mark recapture method to uh, determine the population size. Now, and as well as, and you know, each individual, you know, the size before marking and Individual fish should be marked with some number. After some years, you know the uh, their size. You know the how many years after you catch them, and as well as the size. Then, if you know the size as well as the the number of years that has passed, then you can determine their the, the group. Right? You know the size difference, and you know the age difference, and then you can determine the. Uh, the growth activities for like a, a average uh, growth, then you can use some sort of a, a, a table or graphical method. So, <clears throat> so that's how we are going to use this uh, uh, mark and recapture method to uh, determine the fish growth. And alternative, there's another way of doing it, uh, or actually not alternative ways, the same uh, for the tagging or marking, you can use some different types of uh, tags. Right? These are some of the examples uh, that you can use, right? You don't have to memorize this thing just to get an idea. Uh, different shapes and sizes of uh, uh, tags, you can see how they are tagged in different ways. As you would see in some of the tags, uh, there is some information there. Usually, uh, that information will include a, a number, a unique identification number for that fish, as well as sometimes you will have some printed uh, information like uh, who do who did this research, or sometimes even there is a phone number with a reward, you see, fifteen dollar reward. Right? If you catch, if you are a fisherman, you catch them accidentally, and then you just ring the the researchers, and then you will give some dollar, right, for providing them information. You just need to measure their weight and the length, and just inform them, and they will with the identification number. Uh, then uh, you will be rewarded, right? Most of the, these tags actually they have reward. Sometimes uh, the reward can be big, otherwise no one would uh, inform the the researchers, right? Um, other than that, uh, as you can see here, there are so many different types of tags. Even can be used for smaller fish. And beyond that, some are like uh, electronic tags. You can see here. With a, a lot of sensors, you can have this tag. So they can measure the, uh, whatever the sensors they have, the temperature, maybe the pressure or salinity. And some have even the GPS location where they can report, even like, especially if you're studying the migration of fish, then you can put this, some of these tags and you monitor them. Uh, 
So tagging experiments again in the fisheries management is very popular. Something spend millions of billions of rupees, uh, or not rupees, dollars for this kind of tagging experiment because they are so important that you a lot of information about the, the fish, their behavior, and how they go likewise. Right? So uh, unfortunately in a country like us, uh, we don't have actually this kind of a tagging experiment unless for like very few cases, especially in the for the marine fish, we have never had any tagging experiment. But we know that uh, the the turtle has been attacked. Uh, you remember last in this uh, ship incident, some people talk about the tagging experiment uh, for uh, turtles, right, for their the migrational route, right? Uh, <clears throat> all these are different types of uh, tags, and as well as some are for the big tags, which means the passive indicated transponder, or these electronic tags. You can, using the bar, barcode scanner, you can just scan fish. Uh, and you can get all the data downloaded for some satellite tag where they will automatically send all this data through the satellite directly into laboratory. You don't have to do anything. So you can imagine why scientists do this kind of a huge work, a lot of cost, a lot of uh, time consuming job, but still they spend money and time on these things because they're so important for. If we have a very good uh, managed fisheries, fisheries management program. So there are a number of reasons for tagging and releasing a fish. The first and the most obvious reason is to understand the movement patterns of, of that fish. So we know where it is when we tag it and where it is when we recapture it so we can work out the distance that it's moved. Um, some fish are very resident, don't move a lot, others are highly migratory. So it gives us an idea of the movement behavior of that species. The second reason is to understand the growth rate. So when we tag it, we measure it. When we recapture it, we measure it again, so we can work out at the time that it's been free how much that fish has grown, and we can use that information to validate other methods of aging fish, like using otoliths and so on. The third reason we use less often, but it's really to understand the dynamics of fish populations. We can use the number of fish that have been tagged and recaptured to work out the population size of the stock, and we can also work out mortality rates by using tag recapture. So all that information feeds in to studying the species and, and improving our knowledge of the, the species that we're studying. The reason for getting anglers from the public to help tag and release fish is that there's no ways that a small group of fishery scientists could go out and tag that number of fish over such a wide area in a, sh in a short time as a group of citizen scientists could. And the second reason is that involving anglers and the public in this project teaches them about all sorts of aspects like handling and releasing fish and also understanding the growth rates and the movement patterns of this fish to increase their knowledge so they feel part of the research that's being done. When this project started in 1984, most anglers would catch and kill their fish and if they didn't want to eat them they would leave them lying on the beach kind of thing. There was no understanding of the importance of, of release. We've seen a great shift in particularly the competition angling where the shore anglers, for example, now have adopted catch and release as their program. So they can't catch and kill fish anymore. They, they catch fish, they measure them, and they release them. It's really improving the sustainability of fishing by releasing your fish and not killing them. Right, uh, so that gave uh, some basic information about the, the importance of a, a tagging experiment, as we have seen. 
Um, so again, think of uh, how much effort they put on and this gathering this information. Of course, as the video explained, it's so hard to get for a few fishery scientists to work on this one. That's why they, they have to get some collaboration, some support from the fishermen. And that's what for the citizen scientists. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, research researchers, they use this term now, the citizen scientists. Like, you don't have to be an expert to be a scientist, like provide the data where you, even you, as a public, you can provide a lot of information. Like uh, in the case of the Express Pearl, a lot of people provide us and like, oh, yeah, these uh, plastic pebbles are like this kind of information. Of course, citizen science, right? So there we can use for a scientific purpose as well, right? So that's about the tagging experiment and uh, how we can use for uh, fisheries, uh, uh, especially now in the age as well as growth. Now, the other thing we will discuss about this is how we can use this length frequency analysis for studying the growth. Like it's none other than just uh, plotting a graph with their, the size against the uh, number or the frequency. Usually it should be a free percentage frequency. Uh, like if you plot this kind of graph, uh, as far as you have a, a large number of data set, you can like a separate or segregate the different populations here. Right? So we call actually the cohort, like cohort is like a, the, a group of individuals born in the same year. Like for example, now the, most of the second years, now they are usually a cohort because they are more or less born in the same year, maybe within one or two years. But third years, they are one cohort. Likewise, in the schools, this is very correct. Like in the grade one, it's a single cohort, grade two, five, 10, likewise. Now, how you decide, like how you look at this cohort or how do you segregate this cohort from this length frequency analysis, right? So, we believe that as far as we have a huge database, right? It's very important that you have to catch the smallest fish possible as well as the largest fish, right? And all the sizes in between, right? So if we have all the representative individuals, then like the fish born in the same year, like maybe first year will they? they will have a normal distribution. It's very general, no? the, 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 even the, the grade one student who born in the same year, they will have a normal distribution. And the, the second year one will have a, another normal distribution. The third year will have another distribution, like fourth year, fifth year, likewise. And this is how actually we segregate the age out of this length frequency distribution curve. You just have the length. If it is a human, you measure the height and you segregate that. Right? So just looking at eye, of course, you won't be able to do this one. Uh, maybe some cases you can like differentiate, but it's not always like in, for example, like here, this is a, a scientific study just looking at the, the edge fish frequency distribution, but just looking at this, you want you can't say whether it is this is one group or this is another group, likewise. But uh, you have to use uh, some uh, statistical or other mathematical or statistical method to separate actually the H1, H2, H3, likewise. Uh, if you have all the representative samples, but there are a lot of uh, software to do this job actually if you have the you just need to give the 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 size of individuals again you have to measure as many as possible it's not like 100 200 but thousand ten thousands likewise with all, with all the sizes then you will be definitely you'll be able to get some uh, ages out of this uh, sizes right 
So if all these are softwares like it, not really a software, but a small uh, add-ons for the Excel and FISAT is of this software. You can even pre-download. They can be used to uh, measure the uh, uh, the or to get the edges out of this uh, and frequency distributions, right? Uh, um, <clears throat> like here, uh, this is the graph that you will get from the length frequency, and out of that length frequency distribution, if you put in the 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 software, this they the software will give you the the edge estimated, like how many, like which group correspond to which age like this age one age two age three age four age five six likewise right as you can see as they grow older the size differences are not obvious and it's very hard to differentiate the ages from this but in the very few first few years it's very easy and even if by eyesight you can do it but but with the age it's very difficult anyway you just need to know that Using this kind of a length frequency distribution, you can measure or actually not determine the ages. Right? If you know the, the age, you know the size differences, and per you know the average size for that particular group. Now they are age one, they are like average size, and age two, the average size. And from that, of course, uh, from some sort of a statistical method, you can determine the, the the, the goal, right? And one of these methods called this Patacharya method is, Patacharya is one of the Indian scientists who suggest the, the method, how we can segregate these uh, sizes, right? In me. Uh, as I mentioned before, there are some software to do this. For example, FISAT, uh, it's downloadable from the internet. You just search for FAO FISAT version two. And you just need to uh, add data and then you will get the little bit of computation so you'll be able to get the, the ages out of there, the, the length frequency distribution, right? So that's one way of doing the, the growth. Now the, the other most important that widely used method of a, a uh, growth studies uh, is using hard parts. Of course, using hard parts, you won't be able to determine the uh, growth directly, but you can determine the age using hard parts. But since you know the, the corresponding size with age, you can determine the their growth, right? So the, there are many different ways of uh, doing this uh, hard part analysis using photolith. Autoliths are actually the, the ear bones. Right? The fish has the ear bones. Of course, the fish has no ear. They don't have an external ear, but uh, they have this ear bone uh, for some senses, especially for the balancing. And, and that ear bones, this scientists have found is one of the uh, best way to useful aging fish. Right? The others are the scales, the rays, and the vertebrae. Right? I'll just show you some images, like even this uh, spine. You take a cross section, and you will be able to determine the age. Uh, how are you going to determine the age? Actually, that is looking at the, the how many bands, so how many rings that they have. Right? So, this is a, a scale actually. Uh, now the scale start deposition, depositing the calcium from the like from the center, like we put focus. Around that focus, they they will start uh, storing the calcium with their growth. Right? But you will see that there are the rings can be lighter some sometimes. They can be darker sometimes. The light versus dark, like this kind of pattern that you can recognize. So, why this light and dark pattern? So, usually you see this uh, difference very clearly in the temperate countries, like in the, the, 
the cold countries where they have a winter and summer the winter months it's so difficult for them to feed they won't have enough feed so there won't be a, a large calcium deposits that's where you will see light colors and during the summer or other when there's plenty of food there will be a, a thick calcium deposits that will be marked as dark color right so this dark light light dark like that pattern counting how many dark or how many light color bands are there that give an idea about how old they are right this is proven uh, actually the biologists know that uh, this one been using for the aging trees like tree rings how many rings in the tree indication of uh, the age of that tree the same method you can use for the the, the bony parts uh, in the fit right so uh, how uh, you can use either scales as i mentioned before the spine so whatever the bony parts that they have can be used for the aging of fish uh, scales can be a different types of scales they all have some form of a, this kind of a banding patterns that they can use for the aging uh, as you would see these are all these have some sort of banding patterns right uh, <clears throat> um right so it is some bands may be very obvious where sometimes might not be obvious but uh, uh, however with uh, some experience you can determine that like, how many rings are there right or sometimes even you can use the image analysis like uh, software to do this uh, job uh, for the And determine if you can't do it uh, from UI, you can you can use the the software like the image analysis to do this job. Right? Why right. say so, uh, uh, you can use either spines, even the vertebrae, like in the cartilages, is like in the sharks, where they don't have any bony part other than the vertebrae. Even the vertebrae, like in the, the vertebrae, have these things. Uh, with uh, some experience, you can determine their age, right? So it's very clear. Like uh, uh, you can use this uh, hard parts for their age determination. Uh, it's of course some processing. You might need a lot of processing uh, before counting these things, uh, but uh, but you can do it, right? Uh, this is actually how we are going to do. It. the aging for fish using otolith otolith are the, the ear bones as i mentioned here inner ear bones they have actually three pair of inner ear bones and you have to remove that ear bone and then uh, these are the, the different shapes of the ear bones they can be very different from one fish to another from that ear bone you can determine the Right, so the ear bone we call otolith. It's this otolith, as you can hear, this tiny bone. This is the ear bone. When you once you get it uh, from the fish, and that can be used for age determination. Right. Uh, uh, all these images showing uh, the different band pattern in uh, different uh, uh, otoliths. Right. So this is actually the the top bone right here this is very thick you can see and but uh, that you won't be see anything but you have to cut into a, a thin section if you cut this bone into a thin section where you will see this uh, band impact right uh, sometimes you might need to uh, use some stain or sometimes you have to use different lighting condition and where you will see this uh, The banding pattern, but it's very proven that the banding patterns are there for most of the fish, right? Now the question we have is, how you determine uh, whether they really deposit annually? Right? I mean, you determine their age just counting how many rings are there, or how many bands. But how you are quite sure that these are deposited annually? 
right? There is a way to do that. So like some scientists have do some experiments, like they inject some uh, chemicals, right? Uh, sometimes can be a tetracycline, like some, like you get a small fish, you know the, where you know the age, you inject some tetracycline and it will mark in their bones, right? It's like a sort of a biomarker. And maybe after two years, three years, or four years after, like in this case, one, two, three, four, five, like after several years, they catch them and see how many bands they have. Like now if it is after four years, if they have four bands, which means, or at least if they have four bands after that marking, which means they are four years old. And that way you can validate their activity. These bands are deposited and I mean, it's proven now, like even they have used some uh, uh, like uh, radioactive, like for example, in the tsunami, in Japan tsunami, there were some radioactive uh, chemicals that gone into the sea. And in that particular uh, radiation can be detected in fish. You know, when that tsunami happened, then after how many years now, you can count how many uh, rings, then you can determine their age, right? So you might think that scientists are so crazy, right? Why you worry about the determining the fish age and spend a lot of money and uh, um, effort on this, but it's that important, right? So that's why they are doing it, right? Uh, <clears throat> this actually is some uh, different shapes autolith in different fish. Uh, actually, it's some quite interesting to look at and there's the different shapes and they can be even used for their uh, species identification because they're different from one another. Right, <clears throat> and now, uh, how are we going to determine the, the, the age? Of course, now the problem is like, uh, you catch a fish, and you know the size of that fish and you know the age of that fish, but how you know the how how old they could be, like, a, like how their growth, how can determine from that? That's where you have to use something called the back calculation. Uh, you, even from the same fish, right? Like even from the, like, a, the measuring the length between the, the focus to the, the first band, the second band, the third band. Likewise, if you know the, the, the average distances between the, the focus and the first band and to the, from the focus to the, the unknown band, the distance, the proportion, if you know the, the proportions like here in this case, you measure different uh, size individuals, you know, you measure the proportion, uh, the, the, the radius here, and you measure the length of that group. And for the second group, likewise, if you know the, the ratio between this length to the length of the fish, and, and after so many years, if you can catch a large fish, you know the length of that fish, and you can determine the, the ratio using that ratio. Actually, you can determine the the sizes that could have been in previous years. Like in this case, you measure the the radius, the distance from the, the focus to the each and every radius, the distance, and the the average sizes for that uh, with the for that particular group, right? So may, may this may be one year or likewise. And uh, from that data sheet, actually, you can derive your uh, age class. So you, you can determine the age, of course, uh, need some calculations, and then you will eventually can uh, back calculate the, the, like using this. Uh, very simple equation, the, the fish length at age t, the length at uh, the capture, the, the distance, this distance from the focus to the, 
the unknown size and distance from the the like the distance from the focus to the this size if you know the 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 fish age and the, the size of this fish the unknown age like uh, you don't know about the like in the you we'll say this is 10 years old like in the 5 years time what could have been their size if you want to determine that if you don't have a fish of 5 years size then you can using this equation you can determine like you can recreate all these size classes like what could have been the average size for the each and every uh, the ring right using that equation you can determine like if you know that with the age and the size then you can determine their growth right so little bit complicated thing but uh, of course uh, using that one you uh, you can measure the um the fish age as well as their growth right so very briefly i'll show you how we can do this uh, age determination using the otoli uh, this actually actually uh, i did my even for my post graduate i did it i worked on this uh, otoli so i'm very familiar with this subject these are my own images actually and i was doing my phd uh, so the otoli is called as an age chronometer because that's a really good idea about their age with a uh, a certain certain you can determine the age of the fish like uh, this is actually some of the fish that i worked on you can see the the rings are very clear right uh, not always like uh, this is an example uh, <clears throat> but uh, of course if they are from a cold climate uh, environment of course these uh, these are very clear but not always as you can see now if you know the the number of increments or number of uh, rings and of course you know the size of fish because the, at the time of the catch you measure their size you have the size data as well as the, the age data if you know that if you have that data the size and age data using this very simple equation you can determine the the group right i said very simple equation right well it's not that simple equation it's very complicated the equation but <clears throat> um if you know just know the size of the fish <clears throat> of course group of fish and corresponding age using this equation you can determine the uh, what could have been their lifetime growth like what you call the growth so you can determine this kind of growth right so so you have the length data and age data you see you have only two data sets but you, there are three unknown thing the l infinity k is your right i don't i don't know to go into very detail but uh, the l infinity k and t0 right this if you don't understand just forget about that i just meant the l infinity is the this one so it's sort of a the average size of the the largest set or if you mean size of the largest fish so that is theoretically what would be the largest size that it's not the largest the largest mean size l infinity t0 is some sort of a theoretical thing that's the theoretical age when the length could have been zero like what the when the the length could be zero which means when they have started their life uh, as a Uh, tiny cell that's a t0 and the k is the the, the we call the growth curve or the parameter actually t is the like a indication of the curve age like how quickly they come to this uh, sort of a uh, stagnation we call the asymptotic length like the term used here is called the asymptotic length that is like a leveling of after fast growth they level off here and that is we call the infinity or the symmetric right so if you don't understand just just forget about that but uh, 
Of course, if you are going to be a fishery scientist, this is very important that uh, even though you understand, you don't understand these things, but uh, with some uh, software, if you can determine the age using that software, you can uh, actually <clears throat> uh, get all this information. You can plot even the growth curve uh, using software. I mean, you don't really need a high-tech software, right? You can use even an Excel formula to do these things. Right. Uh, I think second year aquatic students, we have already worked on this uh, assignment uh, using Excel. I have already written the, the, the formula for this one. Using a formula, you can uh, plot graphs actually easily. Uh, if you have actually the age and size data. Right, if you have this uh, age and size data, then you can determine so many other parameters which are very important for fisheries management. For example, here, like a, uh, if you put the, the a plot against the pH and the natural log of their population size, right? And in that plot, you will get something like this. From the slope, you can determine the, the mortality rate, like the, what is the rate that fish are dying, right? So, this is very important because you don't know how many fish are going to die or you have any information about the fish, especially the marine fish. But just knowing their data, like you just get the age data with the, the number and you can determine the mortality. How many fish are going to die in the sea, right? You see, that, that's why this information is very important for a fishery management, right? The other thing, like, a, how fish grow differently in different environments, like uh, actually this is some of my own work we worked on, like how fish grow differently in different temperatures and different latitude. In the same species, we looked at in different latitude. Right? And just to get an idea, you see the same species, the Lichianus Tricius, Lived in Bermuda, the Bailey's, Australia, so like all these are Caribbean uh, countries. Bermuda, you have heard about this. You see the same species, but they have, they live longer in uh, some countries, whereas in the, they live short period of time in some countries, like maximum up to seven years here, whereas in the Bermuda, up to 34 years. There's a huge difference in their the ages. You see this, this difference may be even within the country sometimes, you know, even the same species, if you are going to manage them, maybe one stock living in the southern Sri Lanka, in the northern Sri Lanka may be different. Like if they are managing them, we have to look at different ways. I won't say that they will have this kind of huge variation in their ages, but maybe some other, like their reproduction may be all different. And so that's why you have to look at, that's why it's important, this kind of information in fisheries management, right? Uh, so it's not only for that fish, we have even noted it for some other species as well, right? Uh, Bermuda-like countries where the colder temperatures, they grow bigger and they live longer. So this is sort of a, a concept that I have developed uh, to the, uh, that experiment, right? So. Again, <clears throat> um, this information will provide a lot of information along with other data, like when are they going to mature, whether they are mature enough to catch. Likewise, um, you can get a, a better understanding and better fisheries management uh, using this data. Like for example, in this case, you see, uh, these are experimental data. <laughs> taken from three different boards for the same species, like the chart represents the number of individuals with age. Right? The, the board one, board two, and board three, like very different. Like this black mark here is represent their the age of their maturity, right? So it's I mean same. At the year of four years time they will mature. Now if you are a fisheries manager, you have to decide which boat is doing better. Or oh, we'll say this is two, three different 
locality, so three different countries. So which country is doing good or which locality is doing good? So board one, board two, or board three. Right? So how we are going to determine? Because in the previous, uh, I have mentioned it. Age is important to know because sustainable harvest population means that not harvesting fish when they are too young or too old, right? Because if you catch too young fish, because they don't have a chance to become mature, or they, you, you are catching undersized fish, or otherwise you could have get bit much weight from the same fish if they let them to grow, right? So we shouldn't catch too many young ones. And at the same time, if you catch too many old fish, because old fish means they are reproductively they mature, they will produce, they will be larger fish. The older ones are large and they will produce more eggs. And we will lose the mature fish. Either. So we have to target in between, like something like a board three would be much better in terms of a sustainability not catching the old one, too many older ones, or too many young ones, or, but something like a, a average size, right? So that decision actually has to be taken by the fishery scientists, right? So that information is very important. Right? So likewise, so last week also we talked about like the, the reproduction, the, the life history characteristics, like uh, the uh, the flat size or the number of eggs, how they produce juvenile, their the migration or their dispersal, as well as this, the information of their age and how they grow is going to be a very important uh, factor that need to be considered in the in a good fisheries management program, right? Um, <clears throat> give me a few minutes to show another small video, a bit lengthy, but I will show only for a short period of time. In Grand Isle, Louisiana, the fisheries are abundant, and the fishermen are too. At the docks, fishermen get ready to clean their catch, and alongside them are fisheries biologists from the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. These fish have met their demise and are destined for a dinner plate. But before they are cleaned, biologists have important are abundant, and the fishermen are too. At the docks, fishermen get ready to clean their catch, and alongside them are fisheries biologists from the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. These fish have met their demise and are destined for a dinner plate. But before they are cleaned, biologists have important information or data they can glean from the catch. Elena will get a weight on the fish, Point seven. determine the length, 405. pull the otoliths, and also determine if the fish is male or female. Female. These are the otoliths from a gray snapper, also known as a mangrove snapper. And we just cut out the wedge and they're found right behind the brain. So these are what gives us the age of the fish. Ear stones, scientifically named otoliths, detect sound and vibration and help a fish orientate themselves in the water. But for biologists, they serve some vital purposes. They help give a precise age of the fish. Elena and Claire spend time on the coast meeting with fishermen and asking if they can have the otoliths from their catch. This is the first step in a long process to get the actual age of a fish. Back at the headquarters of Wildlife and Fisheries in Baton Rouge, the Age and Growth Lab receives the otoliths from Grand Isle, along with the data Claire and Elena collected at the dock. This is a box from a specific CSA, a coastal study area, and we would then have them divided up by species. So we check them in and make sure that everything that's on the list is in the box so that we're not missing them in between the field and the lab. Open them up. Sometimes they stick. They got a little bit of fish goo on them. And then, again, put them together to see which one is which. And once you've figured out your tail points to the left, pull your left. They both look good, so we can use our left. We put our right back in here. 
in case there's a reason that we need to sample another otolith again later, this one gets messed up, or for any future research, we have our other otolith. So we always keep the other. Mark the core. And to mark the core, you look into the center and you can see it's a little bit darker right here. It takes a little bit of a little while to kind of figure out where the core is for each fish. Each species is different. The otolith ready to go. The core has been marked. It's trimmed to fit into the base. We've got it labeled. This is number 206. And we're going to place it right here into the mold. And then we're going to do an epoxy resin mixture in here to hold it so that it will be in place whenever we cut it on the ice in that 1000. Okay. And after curing for 24 to 48 hours, this is what comes out of our mold. So we start out with a mold that looks like this, and this comes out. And so it's ready to go, and you can see the number comes off and goes onto the back, so you know exactly which fish it is. That's important, we don't wanna mix those up. Jenny will next head over to the Isomet 1000, a specialized machine for getting a sliver of the otolith, only millimeters thick. So now we line up our otolith, make sure that it is with the blade, but we don't want to cut it. We want the black part, so we'll actually move it just a little to the side so that hopefully we'll get that core section. Now we're going to lower our hood. We're going to turn it on. Increase. Right. And then we are going to make our first section. You can hear the sound. It's cut through the bone. Again, you hear the change in the saw until it's gone through. And then you'll want to just slide it down, careful to not break it. And so there is a section that we have right here. Once the otoliths are on a clear slide, they are placed under the black lights to dry. 20 minutes later, they are covered in Shandon. Shandon is a liquid cover slip that coats the otolith. It is clear and colorless and will not discolor with age. The size of the fish doesn't decide the size of its otoliths. The otoliths that are processed on the Isomet 1000 are from a fish that live in a large body of water, like the Gulf of Mexico. An example is the gray snapper that Elena and Claire were receiving at the docks in Grand Isle. But species like red drum and black drum that live in murkier waters have much larger otoliths. They use these otoliths to pick up vibrations in the water and sense their surroundings, navigate, and find prey. In fact, red drum got its name due to the drumming vibrations they pulsate with during mating season. Mates can locate each other through their otoliths. After Jenny has finished with her first set of otoliths, she next has a black drum otolith to work on. This otolith is much larger and uses a different machine to process it. With my initials on it. Right, so, um, Now you can see, like uh, most of the countries with all these, uh, this kind of uh, develop uh, fisheries management programs, they do this kind of uh, uh, biological research. You can see, as you have seen in that video. I just want to highlight this. You know, you can compare with the our scientists, like uh, fisheries scientists, what they do and. and and how we, they work, right? And we haven't seen anyone working on autolith in Sri Lanka, right? Uh, unfortunately. <clears throat> but even uh, our lab, actually, we have this uh, fish checks any machine, even. And I have worked a little bit on this, but uh, even for your practical classes, actually, usually we do this. Uh, I mean, we just demonstrate how to do this one just for your, like, uh, if any of you to be a fishery scientist, in them, just to give some idea, but uh, I haven't seen so far anyone has used uh, the fish or clip before the, uh, any of the fisheries management programs in Sri Lanka. Right, with that, uh, let's conclude today's session.